On this week's episode of Work Trends, we're talking burnout, why it affects so many of us, what we need to understand about it right now, and what we can do about it. Welcome to the Work Trends podcast from Talent Culture. I'm your host, Megan M. Bureau. Every week, we interview interesting people who are reimagining work. And join us on Twitter every Wednesday, 1.30 p.m. Eastern, using the hashtag WorkTrends. Happy Friday, everyone. What up, Kevin? Megan, I am burnt out. Burnt out. You sound it. I'm actually, or or I could be more specifically, I'm burnt out and I'm Ve- Vegas freezer burnt as well. <laughs> What was up with that weather, by the way? So I know I just came back from a conference in in Vegas, uh, the Recruiting Trends Conference. It's a great conference, but man, and you just didn't want to go outside because it was, it's the part where hell almost freezes over. That was, my, that was my joke. So no no outdoor workouts for me. It was inside. But yeah, but it was a great conference. But you know how it goes, because you and I are going to be doing this soon, too, yep. with a few, a few shows. You, you get a little burnout. You, you're <laughs> huffing and puffing. Yeah. You're doing all these things. You're, you're smiling and waving mm-hmm. and talking and... Talking yeah. shop and presenting, and and uh, I got to it's do two stuff. So, yeah, it was great, though. It was fun. Well, and you get to see people. You get to see our friends and colleagues in person. Absolutely, yeah. And it's all cool. So listen, I'm about to be feeling Portlandia, heading to Portland, Oregon all of next week, which I'm really excited about. And um, we're supposed to be arriving on the day where there's a snowstorm. Oh Which my doesn't God. really happen there much either, by the way. No, not it. No, no, not as much in Portland because that's a little bit inland, no. right? Yeah, and but it's a lovely city, and that is a, an amazingly funny show, by the way. Mm-hmm. That is very, very big, f- big fan. Very, very fun show. There is the. Have you seen? I'm sure you've seen a lot of them, but the one where he he's working from home and then he has that gathering of. <laughs> and, his, and his wife's like, so the cable guy is going to come and you need to let him in. Well, I'm working here. I'm working from home. And she's like, so you're not going to let him in then when he comes to the door. It's hilarious. Anyway, so why don't we get to some news? What do you think? We've got a great article that was just published in January by and Helen Peterson. And it was all about millennials being known as the burnout generation. She's a millennial herself. So she wrote this article. It's a really long article, but it's well worth the read. But the takeaway that I had um, was that she talks about how, as a millennial, she was raised by constantly wary parents. They were actually, the expression was used, vigilante parent, actually. And she was also encouraged throughout school and college to strategize and scheme to find places, times, and roles where we can be effectively put to work. And efficiency is our existential purpose. And we are a generation of finely honed tools crafted from embryos to be lean, mean production machines. That actually wasn't her quote. It was lovely writing, by the way. But it was a quote from Malcolm Harris. There's a book that she references in the article uh, called Kids These Days, Human Capital and the Making of Millennials. But let me just stop there. What do you think about that? What do you think about this whole thing about efficiency is our existential purpose? It's lovely. I think it's a little alarming, to (laughs) be honest. It's lovely and alarming. And it's lovely and alarming. And I think there's some truth to this. And I think we all are, there's a lot of talk about robots, but there's that fine line between staying human and being real with how you feel and not feeling like you need to be programmed all the time because we are so 24-7 on right now. Absolutely. um, I think it's really interesting, actually. I listened to a Hidden Brain podcast that relates to this too uh, when this morning, and that was about latest and greatest science behind left and right brain and what happens in there, and that the right brain is more of the big picture and the left brain is more of the granular details. And the thing about this article, though, that it goes on and it quotes a sociologist that um, who said efficiency was supposed to give us millennials more job security, more pay, perhaps even more leisure. And in short, better jobs, and it didn't. 
And, you know, we, t- we can talk about the huge mountain of student loan debt that a lot of younger folks today, unfortunately, have racked up going to college. And the more that work millennials do, the more efficient they've proven themselves to be and the worse their jobs became. Lower pay, worse benefits, less job security, and then burnout, which is really, again, the culmination of this article. And the fact that all the enjoyable things that we would like to have at work and the world of work and the things that we do and that we're passionate about just get flattened. And it's just becomes this, th- these, these tasks that we've got to get done, right? And that's why I prefer getting to 80%, staying flexible and creative. I know you feel the same way. Getting stuff done without compromising the enjoyment of the big picture. Right? Is that right? It's it's right. But also, it's just about enjoying life. And I think when you're getting programmed and you're always on and you're always thinking about what you're doing next, you don't really get to stay in the moment. And I think... You know, I'm pretty big into yoga these days, hot yoga and different styles of yoga. And it's just about staying in the moment. And I think a bunch of us, and when I say that, I mean all of you out there listening in on work trends, let's all stay in the moment. Let's let's just be happy where we are. I think there's something to it. And I know that sounds kumbaya, but... <laughs> Right? That's okay. Yeah, it, and you know what? And you know what? It, and every time I hear hot yoga, I just want to hear adult themed entertainment music playing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know why that is. I just. Vegas, baby. <laughs> That's what it is. It was the Vegas thing. All right. Let's, go to, let's get to our guest. Beth Bonatti Kennedy has been studying stress management in burnout for 30 years. Welcome to Work Trends, Beth. We we need you here. Thank you, Megan. Great to be here. So, Beth, we want to hear a little bit more about you. It's kind of fun. We live in the same city. Tell us where you are today and how long you've been here in Beantown. Yeah, I live in Beverly, do a, most of my work in Boston and Cambridge, and I've been in Boston for, oh my goodness, plus... 28 years. I went to graduate school at Northeastern, originally from New York, and never went back. Just fell in love with Boston and have had my business um, for 25 plus years. You and I have a couple of things in common. I did the same thing from outside of New York City in Fairfield, Connecticut. Originally moved to Seattle for a while, which was awesome. Went to grad school there for a while, then got involved in recruiting and came back here to Cambridge and haven't left. Oh, my goodness. Um, Yeah. So it's funny, right? Small world. It's really funny, yes. All right. So tell us, how did you get interested in studying burnout? Well, spoiler alert, kind of started with my my first job out of graduate school, which I worked for a major university, and the job was to work in the Boston public schools. I had been certified as a school counselor, and I really thought I was so excited to get my dream job. I was going to be working in five different schools, middle schools and high schools, developing career development programs, working with inner city first generation. And it it felt like this was like what I was meant to be. So I, I loved it the first five years, the first six years. And I was sent to trainings. I had a great boss. So I had all these things you hear are really important for engagement these days. Everything was oh, going great. you said great. the word. We haven't even been in here how many minutes? Everybody, it's buzzword bingo time. Yeah, she did yeah. it. She went there. Yeah. So, um, so, and it was, and honestly, I really, at that point, I was so grateful. And it was so, it was so hardcore. The conditions were awful, but I'm like, this is my calling. I'm going to do this. And one of the things I could not stand was there were so many burned out teachers. But I would tell my friends, you know, I'm in my 20s. You know what? I'm going to make a difference. It doesn't matter. Well, about year eight, I could not believe it. They were all getting under my skin. And I would, it was so sad. I would go from school to school and search out like a good teacher. But then I'd be surrounded and as a school counselor, as an outreach counselor, you're meeting with so many teachers. And then the conditions, they would always throw me in the basement of the school because I was an external vendor coming in. One I, of lo- the schools, I love it. They threw you in the basement. Yes. That, One of the... speaks, that speaks volumes. That as well as I was in there for eight years. I mean, talk yes. about talk about passion and persistence. It took you eight years, if you think about it. Eight years. And one of the schools, it was interesting. It always had this like awful smell. But again, I'm like, got to be positive. I can do this. I can do this. There is a (laughs) smell, though. 
Yeah, they really... There's an icky smell in a lot of schools. And I don't know if it's just mass amounts of people or food or dirt or grime or... Well, I guess what know, I found out. I was sharing the basement what? with with some stray cats. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, right, that rats. I mean, we got options, everybody. Right. Um, that's it. And this is a sad statement for um, how much we value our schools in education yes. on some level. Yep. Right. Yep. We're still fighting for that, by the way. So it was interesting. The red flag for me was there was a day where I I. Not one day, but a month where I was just focused on the clock. And I was like these burnt out teachers. I'm like, I can't believe this. I couldn't wait to get out. Were you were you like a walking zombie? Yes. I have this yes. vision of you. Okay. Yes. There yes. you go. And you could see as a passionate person that just finished graduate school, I was I had the most innovative stuff and I'm like, oh my I lost it. I lost my my zest for making a difference. And I realized there were one really important thing for me. It was really hard to make an impact because I was surrounded by so much burnout and these poor kids had no family support. So I would be setting up meetings with parents and no one would show up. I would do open houses and no one would show up. And it like hit me like a Mack truck, the burnout. So I was lucky enough in Boston, um, you may have heard of, we have a great uh, UMass Medical Center has a program called the Mind Body Stress Reduction Program. I went to that program before it became like an in thing and it changed my life and it cleared my brain and it made me realize as hard as this was, I had to leave this so-called dream job. And it took me two years to resign. It took me two years to resign. Good for and you. And start my business. Doesn't that feel good to just say, <laughs> yes. I'm in charge of my career and yes. it's never going to be easy. It's still no. probably not easy for you. Let's be honest, right? Yeah. It's a, you know, as you know, it's a full-time plus job, but I can't imagine doing anything else. So you have a book that came out, yes? yes. Tell us more. So my book came out in October, and it really was a result of my clients, a lot of my corporate clients saying, this model is, I have a resiliency model that focuses on five areas. And one of the things that they would share with me was, I just feel so much more energized because I make them do all these crazy homework assignments revolving around the model. And to me, that was just... Like what? Tell us. Give us the skinny. Yeah. So for example, so there's five areas, uh, well-being, self-awareness, brand, connection, and innovation. So I'm the mean coach who makes them actually track how they're doing in these areas before every coaching session. So it's so easy for coaching to become just a conversation. And as I mentioned from the beginning, part of my brand is impact. So for me, it was amazing, especially like someone's brand. Um, For example, I'm working with a lot of scientists, but they tend to be more introverted. I love it. Love it. (laughs) So they would go to meetings and they wouldn't be You know, they wouldn't be sharing at meetings, but they're brilliant. So part of it was like, what's the impact and what's that reputation you need in your organization? And all of a sudden, it was like the light bulbs went off. And even they found their career was more exciting because people, they started getting a great reputation. In what way? Well, the biggest thing was now they're not only, we knew that they're brilliant because they went to these great schools, but now they're actually at meetings. They're actually adding value and making sure, you know what, just being an observer is not enough. Just going back to that laptop and figuring out, you know, those molecules is not enough. I have to be at a meeting. I have to add, you know, they're on a lot of teams, but they were, many of them were just sitting there taking it all in. And in, in Cambridge right now, to be the best, you need to be thinking about your reputation, how you're adding value at every meeting and in every email. It's all about being human, right? Right. Learning and, and how doing, to make right. eye contact and have conversation in a way that's impactful, meaningful to who you are in your life and career, right? It's so much more. Exactly. Um, we shouldn't be hiding behind our screens anymore. There's too much of that going on, in my opinion, by the way. Way, way too much of it. And listen, I'm talking from my own experience. I am making an effort right now to just get out and see people, be social. And screen time's great. Being online, being social is great. But there's a balance. And and that really fits in the fourth area of my model is connection. And I actually make people track. You know what? When are you meeting with people? Because if you're at, if you're eating lunch at your desk every single day of the week, if you're not, if you, you know, you, and so I actually make people for homework, you know, in Go out for a drink with someone. Have a lunch with someone from another department. The funniest thing is people will say, Beth, I can't believe how much fun this is. 
for 10 years, I've because I think it's great to be driven in your career. Yeah. But you need to meet, you know, we're, we're losing that sense of trust that happens with that face-to-face interaction. Agreed. I feel like I'm hearing about burnout now more than ever. Has it gotten worse rather than better, would you say right now? I think it has. And I think, I mean, I think we can all kind of resonate with this whole idea of being connected 24-7. I mean, it's fabulous. Like, for example, this morning, I got a text from a client saying, have a quick, quick question. Do you have five minutes? And I'm looking at my day saying, I really don't. But how can I not get, how can I not get back to this text message? We're all so connected that I call it going up the burnout escalator. So it's these little things. So we're connected 24-7. You know, we have, like you said, less connection with people because we are connected by technology. So we're missing out on some of that, even the the fun piece. You know, I think sometimes many of us driven in our careers, we're taking things way too seriously. I look at how many of my oh clients my don't take vacation. Thank you for saying that. Like, where's the humor gone, everyone? Right. If you're listening in right now and you're following work trends, share with us. Are you getting out? Are you sharing with people? Are you telling jokes? Are they good or bad? Um, You know (laughs) what I mean? Like, are you actually, how are you expressing your humanity? That's my question for everybody today out there who's listening. So it is getting worse, huh? Oh, I, you know, and and maybe it's, maybe it is because we're, you know, we're talking about it so much and I'm seeing so much about it. But I will be honest with you, many clients that you know, I, I do a lot of leadership coaching in Boston and, and in other states uh, virtual. And people will say to me when they read my book, I talk about the five stages of burnout. And the first thing they'll say to me is stage four, Beth, I am because, you know, stage five is when it affects your mental health. And that's when it, you know, up to stage four, okay, there's wait a so minute. many Are things you, we am can I, do. Am I, why am I getting cancer in my mind right now? Why is it coming to me? Is there are there similarities here with the stages? You know, it's so interesting. I've never I've never even thought about that. Right? I have never even we were talking thought about, about that. that before. Oh, my goodness. I You're the first person to well, actually bring that correlation. Just it's, saying. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really. And the thing that I share with people is that you can be completely in burnout if you don't, if you, if you start taking care of yourself and start little tiny strategies, you can get out of it. But a lot of people, you know, they just feel like, okay, it's just going to be doom and gloom. And then they end up with real serious mental health issues. And that's when it gets scary because, you, you know, people can't work. They have nervous breakdowns. It's, It's a very scary, it is a very scary thing. And how has the conversation about burnout changed? It's amazing. I just got invited to speak at a conference in Toronto on February 20th. I was approached because they wanted someone to talk about burnout. So this is a business conference being put on by their their major paper, The Globe and Mail. So that was a topic on their agenda. So I think it's great. I think it's not like um, in a lot of the corporate programs, it says when they're marketing my class, it says beat burnout. It's not like we're hiding like we used to and we have to just say it's a stress management class. I feel fortunate to be in the Boston area because I feel like we're pretty progressive. We are. And yeah. Com- yeah. And companies are saying, we know this is going on. We need to we need to offer services. You know, it's it's not all the company, but it helps to offer resources. Tell me about your model. How do you help people think about burnout? So one of the things I try to do is get away from theory and keep it really simple, doable, actionable. So as I mentioned, there's five areas, but how I make it actionable is I have my clients do what I call the Friday Five. So they put in their phone five minutes and all they do is assess, okay, this week, how did I do with my well-being, my self-awareness, my brand, my connection, and my innovation. For example, let's use the example of well-being. So, uh, Beth, I exercised one time. Okay, fine. What do you want to do next week? So it's basically to take five minutes and just reflect on these five areas, not to set New Year's resolutions, but to keep it really small for the next week. And that's how we make impact. It's, I think the problem is some of us just set these huge lofty goals that are ridiculous and a lot of my clients, it's, you know, I'm going to walk for 10 minutes three times a week. Great. Connection. It's amazing uh, yeah. to me because there's people out there who are cynical on coaching. Yes. I know who you are out there. Tweet with me, <laughs> would you? Send me a, yeah. send me something over at Work Trends and share your thoughts. But they're they're like, 
this isn't like this just seems like it's dumbed down and that's no offense to you i'm talking about like the coaching industry in general what would you say to skeptics out there who are like what come on that doesn't work yeah i would say yeah i would say um i think probably for me i've had my business for 25 years and even during the down times in boston my business has continually grown consist like the numbers are talking right Yeah. So, and I think if people, you know, I would, I would encourage people here to connect with me on LinkedIn and actually say that I will, I'll only connect with people if, if, you know, you were on the Work Trends podcast. That's the ultimate hook, everybody. Yeah. And we dare you. (laughs) Yeah, we dare you and read, you know, read, you know, there, I, I'm amazed, you know, read some of the reviews from some of my clients over the 25 years. And well, hey, kudos to you, by the way. Talk about a hustle, right? (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, It's about impact. It really is about impact. It, It is about impact. So, so when you talk about the brand piece of that five minutes, what's that include? Yes. So the brand piece is really thinking about when you are at your best, what are the three words that describe you? So what what are you bringing to that organization? But also, so when you're when you are at your best, what's the impact you're making on a weekly basis? So I hate to tell people this, but it is challenging in today's, you know, world of work with so many layoffs or whatever. But if you track weekly, what's the impact you're making for your department and your organization? That's the best job security you can have because guess what? At the end of every three months, you have this incredible list of I've achieved this, I achieved it. And I do that for my business. Wow, I was on, what did I accomplish this week? Because it's so easy, I think, at work to get into this, just moving forward, moving forward. But, but what's the impact? What are people saying about you when you're not in the room? What's your reputation? So that's what I would have people just really quickly, what was your impact this week? Really simple. Okay, so what can employers do here? I mean, yes, we get that, you know, there's a bunch of us who are employees and this works for us, but let's flip this around. What can organizations do to stop all this from happening? Well, I really think that all companies now, all these progressive companies have their competencies that they're, you know, people are focusing on. And I think we need to really relook at resiliency being a competency because things are only going to continue. Change is the norm. Things are going to get faster. And I I think really having employees figure out what works for them, how can they be their best, but put the ownership on the employee, but encouraging resiliency. And I think we're seeing it. I mean, we're seeing some, you know, some people with the commuting are realizing, can I work virtually two days a week? Okay, that's going to make a huge difference for someone's well-being. For self-awareness, what department do I really want to be in? What's going to use my strengths? We're seeing a lot more of that. But I think it needs to come from the leaders from up above. It just can't be a little HR initiative that a few people, yeah. What can managers do on an individual level to help employees who are feeling burned out? What are the little things? And again, let's go back to your easy breezy steps because we can be lazy at times. Yes. And I think one of the best things that managers can do, and I talk uh, talk to many of the managers that I coach about this, is checking in with their with the employee not just once a year about how is what's your career fit been like. It's to have that conversation, even if it's once every other month, and also asking that employee to take the ownership to say, hey, which projects are really using your strengths? Which projects do you need some assistance in? But empowering the employee to lead the conversation. So I think I think sometimes we feel like the managers need to be the fixer upper on everything. And I think as employees, we need to be proactive for our own career. Speaking of people who are being proactive about their careers, let's talk about Generation Z a bit, shall we? Who some of which are still in school. How can we talk to the future generation about developing habits to prevent this so we don't have to keep yammering on about all this? Now, we will because we're human, but you know, <laughs> that's my caveat. You get it. Yeah. It's really interesting. The last three years, I've been hired to do pieces of this resiliency model for summer interns at companies in Boston. And I was hesitant at the beginning to accept it, to actually even put a bid in because I said, I really focus on employees that have been kind of working for a while. I'm not sure this is going to feel too whatever. So the part that I did was the brand and the connection and the innovation. And I cannot believe how receptive these students were to the point that a few actually said, you need to go to my college. You need to be teaching this to our professors. 
So one of the things about brand too is even, you know, those of you that are in the business world that do use LinkedIn, looking at that once a month, taking that five minutes and saying, when's the last time I updated it? You know, what is my, how's my picture? What's my summary? You know, (laughs) I need need to, speaking of, I should be doing that myself. Sometimes you get so into helping other people, right? Yes. You forget about like, oh my gosh, wait a minute. (laughs) So good point. And again, it only takes a couple of minutes, right? Right, right. We don't have to overthink this. Right, right. Let's talk about the future. How are you predicting work is going to change in the next 10 years? You know what? It's interesting. I know that things, when we think about, you know, we when we forecast the future, I think we know things are only going to get quicker and faster and technology is going to kind of even go to the quicker level. So I personally think resiliency is going to become even more important. And it's not like burnout's going to disappear because we always have these employees that feel like being addicted to urgency and looking like we're super busy is going to get us that next promotion. So we're always going to have these individuals that don't see resiliency as a priority. But I do believe as we're starting to see the research, Google is doing a lot of research on the brain. There's been a lot of amazing mindfulness research on the brain. So we're seeing the science to show that taking time for your resiliency can actually change your brain. I think when people start seeing, when I show these statistics in classes, people are like, can I try meditation? So I think we're, we're finally seeing the evidence. You know, I think the stress is always going to be there, but I feel like people are going to be more proactive. Awesome. Well, thanks for stopping by, Beth. You're welcome. Let's keep the conversation going. Join us for our Work Trends Twitter chat. We are going to be on the Twitters with Beth Bonatti Kennedy on Wednesday, March 6th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific. Join us. And I want to hear from you. If you're feeling burned out, you can share. I'm here for you. And if you'd like to get our Twitter chat questions in advance, sign up for our newsletter at talentculture.com. Thanks for listening to Work Trends from Talent Culture. Join us every Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern for a live Twitter chat with our podcast guest. To learn more about guests featured on today's show, visit the show notes for this episode at talentculture.com and help us spread the word. Subscribe to Work Trends wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave us a rating, review, and iTunes. Share Work Trends with your coworkers, your friends. Look forward to it. See you next time.